um, thanks for that introduction. It more or less covers that first slide. So the test bed um, got the go-ahead in January 2016 and is a, um, a very complex program. You can see here that we're working with several different um, sort of aspects of industry. So we've got um, 14 innovators that we're working with and we're working to deliver the project through two very, very different um, new Vanguard sites. So at the time that we were getting the go-ahead for the testbed, these new uh, models of delivery were being formed in the two areas in which we're delivering um, operationally our testbed programme through. So a lot of change going on at the same time. I think also as well to understand here uh, in the clinical delivery models, We've got the two vanguards, but within those vanguards, there are CCGs, there are provider organisations, different services. Uh, we're being evaluated uh, by the university, and um, the test bed is actually being hosted by Lancashire Care Foundation Trust, um, and with the Health Hub and the Innovation Agency. The reason for this slide is to is because I'm hoping this session is going to be really practical for people. It actually outlines how many different people it was necessary to liaise and build relationships with before we even started. So all these individuals and representatives from these individual uh, organisations <coughs> were required to sign a collaboration agreement before we could even start to recruit patients. And um, I say we got the go ahead in uh, January 2016. We were hoping to start recruitment of patients by the June and it actually took till December to get the information governance resolved, all those issues with all these different partners and uh, the collaboration agreement. So that's the significance really of, of that um, slide. Working with the patients, so we've got four cohorts within the test bed programme. The cohort, all, all are aged over 55. Cohort one are patients with a high risk of admission to hospital with a diagnosis of long-term condition. Um, predominantly we've found they've tended to be COPD patients that have come through the test bed programme but we do have some heart failure patients as well. Uh, cohort two again we've, we've um, pretty much got the same split between COPD and heart failure these are patients with um, a lesser um, risk of admission. Um, I should possibly just say a quick bit about the text so in cohort one patients are offered uh, a Philips Motiva system which is um, a tablet that they hold wi within which they record their vital signs on a daily basis. Those then go through to a clinical hub um, and um, at the moment we've got a, in, the, in the Morecambe Bay area we've got a, roughly about 150 pa patients on this and it's taking nursing staff about an hour, an hour and a half to monitor all those patients because they, if, if they're, if the range, if they readings that they submit fall out of their normal range, then it will um, program an alert on the system. So clinicians are just directed to those patients that actually need their input rather than them having to, to consider everybody on the, on the program. <coughs> Cohort two, we offer, um, oh, I should also say about the Motiva tablet, it also um, relays educational videos to patients around their condition and how to manage their condition. Um, Cohort two, we have got Interlessent, which is a How Are You Today app for COPD. And um, we've also got the option of Flow, which is an SMS messaging service. And that we have protocols in that for COPD and heart failure. Um, cohort three, um, I'll be honest, we struggled with because we found when we actually got down to it that to identify patients who were over the age of 55 with a long-term condition but had a low risk of admission to hospital, they, they weren't there. We couldn't identify them and the few that we did, we found that actually they didn't have smartphones uh, or they didn't want to take part. So um, I think uh, from one GP practice, we identified possibly about a thousand people who might be interested in taking part. We actually only recruited about 15, 20 from them. So people who were willing to take part and who had the tech. Um, cohort four is patients with dementia, a diagnosis of mild dementia, and again we're offering them the Philips U Motiva product with a dementia protocol that has been built as part of this program. So they didn't have a dementia uh, pathway or protocol built into the system before the test bed program, and we've been able to develop that with our specialist uh, dementia nurses. 
interestingly, we've got about 10 to 15 patients now on this um, programme and they're already giving us feedback, which means that we're going to relook at that protocol. So um, that's one thing about the test bed. We've been very reactive to patient um, feedback. So our achievements, we've um, got around uh, just under 700 people recruited across all the four cohorts. We've got about 450 using, actively using the tech in their homes. We've got people joining and leaving. So we've got this sort of people are on the programme for six months. So we're now getting to uh, the point where people are, have, have actually finished their six months, which is a really exciting time because we're beginning to, beginning to, to understand um, how their conditions and how their self-management attitudes have changed throughout the process. Um, we did have to, because we were late starting, because of all the IG and collaboration agreement um, issues, we did manage to negotiate a three-month extension to recruitment. So we actually finished recruitment at the end of this month. Um, we've uh, underway with the Lancaster University phase one and two of the evaluation. So a lot of the qualitative interviews have now been taken place and um, the quantitative analysts are starting to work on the data and they've had the first lot of control data and we'll get the second when we finish recruitment. Um, we have started to look at spread and adoption and there is a group in place working with the two commissioners to look at how we might um, continue to deliver um, telehealth solutions in the way that we're doing within the programme. They're very keen that we don't have a stop-start scenario and that we actually do continue with the momentum and continue to deliver to deliver um, and as I say we've got the interim report which I'm not sure when that will be published but it should be on our intranet so keep your eye out for that um, so in order to achieve all that one of the first things that we needed to do was to look at the governance having a governance structure around the program because we were on a constant basis multi continuing to to generate and, and develop those business relationships with multiple organisations. So to have um, a board that reflected that membership was really critical. Um, so we um, have now moved to Skype meetings as well, which in, um, we should be doing, I suppose, as part of the programme. Um, and they've actually um, proved really, really useful. Uh, we tend to get more people um, dialing in. Um, in terms of operational delivery, we formed two clinical operation groups, one in the Foul Coast Vanguard area, the other up at the Morecambe Bay and Lancaster area. And these were very um, sort of pragmatic based groups looking at actually what are the um, issues and risks that we've got around achieving the recruitment of patients. Um, and I must say they've worked really, really well. People have really come together and, and put in their expertise and their suggestions of how we can um, uh, uh, meet some of the challenges. The Lancaster, evaluation Lancaster University evaluation team have published a first <coughs> lessons learned report and we've got some, some really wonderful case studies that are now published and available on our website. And, um, as, um, Liz mentioned we've got the, uh, the video in the break, which is really inspirational. I would urge you to, to grab a coffee and watch it, um, have a tissue ready as well. Um, and we have got a wonderful comms lead within the team who's developed our website and is constantly twittering on our um, progress. So we're, we're getting quite a lot of attention nationally, um, which is wonderful um, for us all. So. I mentioned earlier around the challenges. The f at one point, I, I had counted 70 individuals that I was trying to liaise with in terms of the collaboration agreement and IG from all the different organisations and the different departments within the organisations. So the IT security, the information governance department, you name it, everybody, um, right down to medical devices we were having liaisons and conversations with. Um, Two vanguards with two very different models of care. So in the Lancaster and Morecambe Bay area, we're working with a GP who um, has recently, well, this just this in the last year, uh, merged with about seven or eight other GP practices to form a super practice. So he's gone from having about 14,000 patients, I think, on his caseload to having 60, over 60,000 um, in, in <coughs> the, the GP super practice. 
In the Fowl Coast, we've got a very different model of care in the fact that, that um, we're working with um, newly established community teams who aren't necessarily led by a lead uh, medic, um, so the nurse-led teams, um, uh, structured based on, on an individual's um, sort of risk of admission to hospital. So we're working with an extensive care team and, um, and with the neighbourhood teams. The, thing that with the challenge we've got with working with the, the um, extensive care team is that for our programme, we require people to be on the test bed for six months. Their, um, the, the longest length of stay that they would want people to be in extensive care is four months. So we'll, you know, we immediately we, we, we've hit a, a, against something that we've had to work through. Um, developing different care protocols. So a care protocol is the term that innovators put to the, um, the, the package, if you like, that's loaded within either the SMS messaging service or the Mativa service. So this will be what questions are you asking of your patients, what surveys are you asking of them, what vital signs are you asking of them, what video um, and information releases are you giving to them and when are they scheduled. And um, we had um, different requirements from different teams around those pathways and protocols. Some were easy to tweak, others took um, sort of six to eight weeks to get major changes made. So again, that was something that we had to, to juggle. Uh, recruitment has been challenging, I in the, it, as in the time it takes to recruit somebody because we have to go through the whole um, formal consent process, we consent them onto the study, then explain the equipment to them, um, so that you have to um, make allowances and have resources to, to put towards that task. Um, recruitment of clinical staff, um, we've really struggled to get people um, onto the programme to recruit patients, uh, clinicians to work with us onto the programme. There just really aren't spare nurses out there to suddenly come and work with us for six months. So um, I myself have been out uh, consenting patients in the Morecambe Bay area just to sort of to, to roll up the sleeves and get out there really and get it done. Um, and communication pathways have sometimes been challenging, like I say, because of the various levels and layers of, of management and um, the, the disbursement of all the various key stakeholders really. Um, okay, so working at the moment with commissioners to ask them what they want of us in order for them to be able to make decisions around spread and adoption. So I was talking with one of um, the guys at Expo yesterday and he wants a very sort of simple practical checklist. What do they need to consider? What do they need uh, um, to put resources to? And how long are those decisions and processes likely to take? Uh, NHS procurement guidance guidelines. One of the, the big things that we've um, noticed and came up at Expo um, earlier this week as well and came up in the slides earlier today is around um, security of new tech that you're putting in people's homes. We've, we've got one of our innovator products at the moment that we're just having another look at in terms of its fit for purposeness, uh, it's connected to the internet. We need that absolute assurance that it is, it, it is safe. And I would urge anybody who's um, looking to undertake a similar practice to this to have some IT security specialists on your procurement panel um, to ensure that any system you're buying is going to be fit for purpose for the lifetime of its contract and its use. Um, Again, we found that some of the um, smaller innovators we've worked with w didn't necessarily meet the bar when it came to some of the IG stuff and they had to put changes in place in order them for them to become of a standard that they could operate with us within the NHS. Um, again, I, noted, I, I mentioned at the beginning that um, at the time when we were launching the test bed, there were other, many other things going on in the two local vanguards, so new services being formed, um, uh, they were uh, struggling to recruit to posts, so we were kind of competing against them or with them rather around um, priorities that they may have within the vanguards and the priorities that we had as a test bed programme. Um, and the evaluation, so the Lancaster evaluation is fairly sort of rigid in the fact that we, uh, our patients have to be over 55, they have to have a diagnosis. And some of those um, restrictions, we were thinking, gosh, if we could only take people from 50, we could absolutely um, hit those trajectories much, much easier. But, but we had to stay within what had been ethically agreed. Um, 
So one of the things that I've found in working in the test bed programme and one of the things that's been so rewarding has been people's willingness to get in and get involved and to help it to be successful. And I'm talking about people um, from the innovators to people from the university. Um, we've really, really worked hard together and some wonderful relationships have been built by people who previously um, have never worked before. Um, th there are there have been times when we've had to understand each other's different cultures and approaches, um, but usually a bit of humour and a bit of um, yeah, um, willingness gets, gets you through that. And it is very important to understand the different places where people are coming from in an endeavour like this. You need to have that understanding. Um, so yes, listening, um, especially to the service users. One of the products that we have, the SMS messaging um, service, we got feedback fairly swiftly that actually it, there were too many messages going out to patients and flow was becoming a bit of a nuisance uh, bossy flossy they were calling her and like will you switch this thing off and you know, so um, we immediately went in and adjusted the protocol so that instead of asking for readings every day we only asked for them three days a week and we've trimmed down a lot of the messages that were going out to patients because um, we, we want to keep people in the programme, so the last thing we <coughs> want to do is alienate them because um, they're getting multiple messages from, from the system. Um, and the dog with the bone approach, absolutely. There's the, a lot of the people that we've worked with have just been a case of, we will get there. We absolutely will get there because I think people really, I think the importance of telehealth and I think the, the excitement of it and its possibilities are really what switch people on to working within this um, emerging area. So talk before about the development of the COGS, so having a very local operational um, group of people who are very close to the ground who actually know what's going on there and, and where we can get in and where we might need to hang back. Um, regular reporting. Um, I myself, I spend a day a week um, Yes, I was just looking back at that actually. I've, I've literally sort of been dashing around with uh, thermometers and pulse oximeters and teaching 80-year-old men to use a mobile phone and to text for the first time. And, um, but absolutely loving the fact that they're so keen to want to learn, to be involved and getting that, that instant feedback about, oh, I, I feel so reassured that I am being monitored from, from somewhere and just building people's confidence. But I don't want to talk about that here because you'll get all that in the video. Um, yeah, so, uh, yes, the technology, we, not only have we learned about, and I'll take what you were saying, Carol, earlier before, and we did come and see you guys actually in Liverpool, which was brilliant, I'm still in touch with you guys, um, but understanding the technology, so when we first got the technology, I had no idea what an SMS text messaging service was going to do, what it was going to deliver. And we've actually got to the point now where not only are we understanding more about the technology, but the innovators themselves are understanding that their tech does things they didn't know it did. So there's been learning on both parts, and that's because we're really drilling down into the detail because we want to get the absolute best value for money and the best possible service that we can offer. So we're really pulling everything apart, really. And I think as we go forward with the spread and adoption, one of the first things we've said is that we want to get all those care protocols and absolutely analyse exactly what's in them and make sure that they're the best they can be. Uh, again, information leaflets around the technology. So um, there is some sort of standard stuff that goes out, but we were finding it wasn't enough for people. So we've done our own sort of like crib sheets, um, how to turn your phone off, how to you know, all these sorts of different things. They've gone down really well and been really useful. Um, we've gone out, uh, we've promoted test bed, we've taken Q&As from clinicians, we've tried to, to, to talk as much as we can um, around people. Um, yeah, we, as I say, we, we bought mobile phones because we were getting to a point where we were identifying patients who, were, who would be suitable for test bed programme, but they actually didn't have a mobile phone, but they were really interested in it. So we went out and we bought 20 really basic mobile phones, got them locked down. And um, so now the fact that you don't have a mobile phone doesn't mean to say you can't take part in our programme because we'll provide you with one. They were only 20 quid and um, it's just a way of getting additional people um, online. Um, yeah. Uh, 
liaison with um, other project leads within the other uh, seven testbed programs. We've been at Expo in the last two days, so that was wonderful. We were all together, we were able to share learning. Um, keep asking the what if questions. So I think this is the, the point that we're getting to now. We're coming up towards the end of recruitment and now's the time where we can take a little bit of a deep breath and think, right, what have we learned and what's possible? What's possible now with this? Because actually going forward, we're not going to be restricted to these cohorts of patients with these conditions. What could we do with mental health? What could we do with you know, child and adolescent psychiatry? All those sorts of things. Um, so we've got a lot of strategic links in other things that are going on. Uh, the last week or so has been so strange for me because I keep bumping into familiar faces and this is obviously working at this <coughs> different level and seeing what else is going on within the county with the, uh, and within the STP um, pro, uh, footprint. Um, we have an NHSE account manager that we um, liaise weekly with and re uh, provide reports to, so we're very closely monitored by NHSE um, around the, 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 uh, the programme. Um, so, going forward, it's all hands on deck to recruit uh, to the maximum amount of patients we can possibly get by the end of September and to make sure that we retain those patients so uh, the care pathway work might start sooner rather than later actually if we feel that we can make improvements now that mean that, that we're going to keep these people on. Um, Expo's been and gone, thank heavens. Lydia, our comms lead, will be <laughs> thankful of that. But it was really, um, it was really successful, and we delivered the video there, and we had Q and A's with um, uh, one of the patients on the test bed. Um, so we continue to work in partnership to um, to develop and and grow the test bed. Uh, they announced at Expo there's going to be another two years of funding. What that's going to look like, we don't know, but we've got our fingers crossed, and we're hopeful. And um, our final evaluation report from the university will be next June, so I'm sure we'll be making a big fuss about that. And I think we're on to the panel now, aren't we? Yeah, so thank you very much. You.